Thank you guys so much. Uh, good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers who are here, represented here. Um, we hope you feel honored. Um, we hope you feel loved and supported. Um, we love moms around here. And today we're going to be talking about something that moms, you know all about. You have like a special sense when it comes to this. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a word I personally distaste. Um, it's the word uh, disciplines. We're going to going to be talking about disciplines. And uh, disciplines are the things that you're supposed to do that you don't want to do. Things you're supposed to do that you don't want to do. So when I was a little kid, uh, my mom wanted me to develop into a nice, polite, courteous boy. So she would tell me on Monday, Ray, um, go wash your hands before dinner. And then on Tuesday, she would say, Ray, go wash your hands before dinner. And then on Wednesday, go wash your hands before dinner. Ten years later, Ray, go wash your hands before dinner. And she did this over and over and over. And it was a discipline for me. It was for her. She had to remind me because she wanted me to develop into someone who, if I go to dinner with someone, I'm going to wash my hands before dinner. And that's just one example, right? I had to say thank you, say excuse me, say you're welcome, say please, make your bed, do the dishes, eat your food, uh, don't hit your sister. I mean, all these things that as a grown-up, I'm supposed to do automatically. And for the most part, I would say 9 out of 10, um, I've picked them up. I wash my hands now. I say thank you. I say please, you look nice today. How's the weather? I can do all those kind of polite, courteous things that um, nice people are supposed to do. So my mom did a good job on that part. Um, but as an adult, I've noticed that there's other areas of my life that I need discipline. You know, I read a book, I see something, I notice something, I go to the doctor, something comes up and I notice that I need discipline in some area and there's things that I should do that I don't want to do. And that's why whenever I hear about something in this discipline area, I get kind of stressed or anxious because it's kind of all exhausting. It's tiring when you hear about all the areas of our life where discipline is required, right? I mean, here are just a list that I made. Um, you need to get up earlier. You need to get to bed earlier. You need to eat less, eat healthy, exercise, save more, spend less, budget better, more one-on-one -on -one with your kids, more time with your wife, make sure you call your mom, make sure you, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And who really has time to do all of that? And, and okay, you try. Let's say you make an effort. Okay, I'm going to try to be disciplined. I'm going to eat healthy. I'm going to wake up early and, I, and I'm going to call my mom on Mother's Day. Those are things we should do, right? We work on that. And then, I don't know about you, but you meet someone who is way more disciplined than you. Like they have it much more together than you do. And, and kind of you, part of you is kind of inspired. You're like, wow, this is cool. They did it. But the other part of you wants to kill them and you're annoyed by them because, you know, it's 7 o'clock in the morning, you're just rolling out of bed and they're jogging with their dog and pushing a stroller at the same time. They've already done half a day's work and they tell you they don't need coffee. They just wake up energized. And um, I hate those people. I'm sorry. They're just annoying. Nobody likes them. Um, don't, if you don't need coffee, just don't tell anyone. Just pretend. Pretend it's coffee. Just drink it. Um, anyways, um, we, all, we all know that and we feel that way because there's a sense and no matter how disciplined we are, no matter where you're at, there's always someone who's a little bit more disciplined and when you compare yourself, that, you, that kind of points out your weaknesses and we all have weak areas. So, I mean, disciplines in general, they're just hard. They're difficult. Um, the thing about disciplines is that they require discipline and that's the hard part determination, commitment, they're, they're just difficult things. But at the same time, we know they're in some areas of our life. That's exactly what we need. We need to be disciplined in that area. So here's a couple observations I want to point out before we get into what Jesus says about this. Um, here's a couple of things I've noticed about disciplines and over time. So um, here's the interesting thing. Number one, over time, these disciplines that you hate, that you dread, that you can't stand, that are frustrating, over time, these things can become a pleasant habit. 
over time, something that you started off hating, you do it and you do it, and then over time it becomes a hobby, something you enjoy. For some people, it even becomes an obsession. That's just something that happens with disciplines, right? So you've met people who, who do exercise. They jog, they run, CrossFit, weights, whatever it is. And they had an appointment with their doctor. The doctor said, you need to get in shape. So they make you start working out. You get your gym membership. You start going, and at first you hate it. It's the worst thing. You're so mad. You're grumpy. You're in a bad attitude about it. You're just doing it out of sheer determination, and you're going. And at first, you're making up every excuse why not to go jogging. It's too cold. It's too hot. It's raining. It's too dry. This outfit doesn't match. My shoes are uncomfortable. And you're just, these are all the excuses I've used in the past. That's why I just thought of them real quick. You come up with all these excuses of why not to do it. But you do it anyways, you do it anyways. And then over time, something happens. And you're not exactly sure when, but over time, something clicks, something flips. And, and something you hated, you begin to enjoy, or, or you don't mind it, and then you enjoy it, and then you start loving it. And there's people now, I'm not one of them, so don't ask me, but there's people here who are like that regarding exercise. You talk to them, and they love it. They get energized by it. They look forward to it. They can't wait to get to the gym. They can't wait to put on their running shoes. Um, and this discipline turned out to be something that became a pleasant habit. That's my first observation. My second observation about discipline, and this one's actually good news, is that um, discipl disciplines, if you, you do them over time, um, they're always going to result in progress. If you decide to be disciplined in any arena of your life, you name it, whether it's finances, your health, your eating, your family, if you decide to be disciplined in that area over time, you're going to see results. You're going to see some level of progress. Um, if you decide to eat healthy for a long period of time out of discipline, you're going to have, be healthier. If you decide to spend quality time with your kids over time, that's going to result, prog you know, you're going to see progress in your relationship with your kids. I mean, that's good news. And the best part about that observation is this. It doesn't even matter what kind of attitude you have. You could be grumpy and mad and complaining the whole time you're being disciplined. Even if you have a bad attitude, you will see, you'll still see progress. So I'm getting up every day, and I'm mad, and I'm grumpy. I hate working out. I hate having to run. And I'm, I complain about it. To anyone who will listen, I'll complain. The dogs, the cats, I'm telling them how much I hate running. I'm yelling at neighbors as I run. Over time, I'm still going to see results because that's the way disciplines work, right? Um, this has happened. You've seen this, right? Like some of you who are musicians, they made you, your parents put you in classes and you started um, going to these uh, guitar classes or piano classes or drumming classes and you hated it and you're like, mom, please don't make me go. But your mom made you go and you did it anyways. And over time, this thing that started off as a discipline, now you enjoy it, and then you love it, and then you're TJ, and you're leading worship at Washington Cathedral, right? It, it happens over time. It becomes this enjoyable thing. It happens with me regarding uh, reading, right? When I was a kid, reading was an important thing to do, and everyone I knew wanted me to read, and I hated reading. But my mom made me read. My teachers made me read. Every adult in my life for my birthday would give me books, and I hated it. I don't want books. I want toys. But they would give me books. And over time, this thing that became a, started as a discipline became a delight in my life. And I really enjoy it. One of my favorite hobbies is reading. So because of these two observations and what we're going to see based on what Jesus says, here's what I think is a possibility. Over time, disciplines can become delights. They can become things that we enjoy. They can be blessings. They can be things that help us, that we look forward to. So that's kind of where we're going to go. I'm going to give you a couple examples. Like I mentioned, uh, I, I've decided to start getting healthier and start doing exercise, and I want to do it early before the kids get up. So I've been waking up early, and I have a really bad attitude about it, and I hate running, but uh, Elisa's not letting me play basketball anymore because I've broken every part of my body at some point, 
um, playing basketball, so she actually sent my shoes away. I don't have any basketball shoes. So the only thing I have are running shoes, and I have to go running, but I hate running. There's no one there to complain. No one's listening to me anyways. I just don't enjoy it, but I'm doing it anyways. Out of sheer determination, I'm doing it. And I woke up early this one day last week, and it was too cold, and I was complaining and yelling because it was so cold. Um, and then God blessed me, and I ran right by a Krispy Kreme donut. And it was God's way of saying, this is your delight. This, this, no, I'm just kidding. That's a horrible example. Let me give you a real example. That did happen, and that was awesome. But uh, my work schedule is from like Saturday evening to Thursday, and, and my, one, my day off is Friday. So I love my day off, and on my day off, I sleep, and then I veg, and then I sleep some more, and then I veg some more. That's all I want to do. Well, two years ago, um, we got an addition to our family, Isabella, and Elise asked me, Ray, would I want to work on Friday, so can you um, take your day off to um, watch or dad or whatever it is, take care of, nurture uh, our child, Isabella? And I said, Elise, you have such audacity. This is my one day off. You want me to take my one day, the day after I've been working all week and I'm exhausted and stressed, and you want me to take that one day to go and take care and love my... It sounds really bad when I say that out loud. <laughs> I, I, I know that now, but... At the time, it didn't sound as bad. And you have to imagine, poor Ray doesn't want to do this. This is a one day. And I did it. I did it out of sheer discipline, making myself. I want to sleep in. She wakes up all throughout the night. I got to change her diapers. I got to get her dressed. Um, I got to do whatever she wants to do, watch these shows that are just horrible. And I'm just spending time with her and loving her. And over time, this thing that started off as a delight, I mean, as a discipline, and I love my daughter. That doesn't have to do with that. Um, but over time, this discipline became a delight. And now, and I'm not exaggerating, like the best parts of my week are that Friday morning when I get to spend that time with Isabella. It's our like date day and we have, and my son has one Wednesday afternoon. And, and this thing that started off as difficult because I wanted to sleep in and I did it because I had to has become such a delight in my life. I enjoy it. It gives me energy. It gives me life. I look forward to it. And, and moms, like you do this and you understand this idea more than most of us because you're put in the situation, moms, where you don't really have a choice. You kind of have to be disciplined. As soon as you have a kid, there's a million things you have to do in order to a, survive and have your family survive, right? So moms, you have to wake up early and change diapers, and that happens for years, and then you have to make lunches, and that happens for years. Then you have to drop them off and pick them off. There's soccer, there's baseball, there's um, dancing, gymnastics, there's math clubs, and all these different things, and you're just back and forth, and these things become, you know, they start off as disciplines, but you eventually you notice that they become delightful, right? You ask your son for the hundredth time, how was their day? And they say, great, I don't know. What happened today? I don't know. And that moment that seems so wasted is not wasted. It becomes a delight. It becomes something you really enjoy. And that's why I feel like with this principle, it, moms, you understand it more than anything. Over time, things that start off as disciplines can become delights. So the reason I'm bringing all this up is because we're right in the middle of a series called Five Things God Uses to Grow Your Faith. And what we believe is that God wants to grow all our faith. God wants to take you wherever you're at to a place that no matter what is happening around you, you can look God and say, God, I trust you. My family, I don't know what's happening, but God, I trust you. My finances, God, I don't know what's happening, but I trust you. My job seems crazy, but God, I trust you. And I think that's what God wants all of us to be. To this. He wants to grow our faith. And a couple weeks ago, we saw that God uses practical teaching, the Bible. He uses that to grow our faith. He also uses people. We saw providential relationships, that God puts people in our lives, and God uses those relationships to grow our faith. And today, what we're going to see is that God uses private disciplines. So when I hear the story of people who've grown in their faith, who've developed big, overwhelming faith, faith that overcomes fear, when you hear their story, you're going to hear something like this. And then I started to pray. 
every morning. And then I started to make a discipline of reading the Bible every day or memorizing. And they'll tell you the story of this discipline, this private discipline that they started to engage in. And through the course of that discipline, their faith began to grow. And they'll say, at first it was hard. It made no sense. I felt like I was talking to myself. I was talking to a wall. The Bible made no sense to me. Talking out loud was weird. But over the course of time, they saw progress. And what started off as a discipline became a delight. And now when you talk to those people, they say, I can't live without it. I have to connect with God. I have to pray. If I don't get that Bible in me, I don't, I'm not my true self. And this is one of the things God uses to grow our faith. And it's all throughout the Bible. And what we're going to see is that Jesus, he thought so highly of this idea of private disciplines that right in the middle of his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he takes time right in the middle to explain to the audience why these private disciplines are so important. So we're going to read some verses, six verses in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. And we're going to see that Jesus is going to identify three private disciplines and that these private disciplines have the potential to grow our faith. So um, you've all read these verses before for the most part, I bet. So as we read them, I don't want you to focus on the actual discipline. I want you to focus on faith because these disciplines are a mechanism to grow your faith. And that's what God wants. God wants big faith. So here we go. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So this is his introductory statement. Jesus is saying, listen, um, there are some acts of righteousness. That's his way of saying private disciplines. There are these private disciplines that you can engage in. And if you do these disciplines privately and consistently, over time, your faith will grow. Your father will reward you. But don't do it in front of people. And then he's about to explain three disciplines. I'm only going to talk about two of them. Um, the third one is way too hard. So you can read it on your own. It's in the Bible, but I'm not going to focus on it. So here's the first discipline, verse 2. So when you give to the needy, giving to the needy is a discipline. Do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. So this was a practice that was practiced in that culture uh, where they would give alms to the needy, to the poor. And back then, it was a big show, pomp and circumstance. And these people would come and give their donations in a very visible way. And people would clap and cheer. And Jesus is saying, that's their reward. People say, wow, that's impressive. But that's not the reward your father has for you. So don't do it like that. Instead, here's what I want you to do. Verse 3. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. It's in secret. That's why they're called private disciplines. You don't know how much I gave. I don't know how much you gave. We do that in secret. We do that in private. And if we do that, here's a promise. Um, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Your father sees you when you do something in secret. So when you give privately, secretly to whatever, your father sees that. And when he sees that, he knows exactly what you're doing. He knows your circumstances. And he will reward you. That's the promise. And we've seen this acted out a couple of times in, in scriptures. You remember that widow who gave a penny, uh, all she had, and people judged her. But Jesus said, wait a second, you don't know what's going on. My father sees what she did, and she gave all that she had. So we see that principle there. Um, and Jesus is saying that when we give, when we practice this private discipline, our father who sees what is done in secret will reward us. So Let's pause here for one second because think about this. Jesus is telling this message to an audience that is mostly composed of peasants, people who live day to day. 
They don't have bank accounts. They don't have savings. They don't have equity. Those are foreign concepts to these people. That's why they pray, give us today our daily bread. They're not worried about tomorrow. They just want us to revive the day. And to these people who are living daily, Jesus says to them, this isn't a money thing. This isn't a giving thing. This isn't about your stuff. This is a matter of faith. I want you to learn to depend and trust in God. And by practicing this discipline, discipline privately, you can say, you know, non-verbally, God, I trust you. So for Jesus, this isn't about giving. This is about faith. He wants to grow their faith, and he wants them to learn to depend, to trust in God. And to, for these people to give anything, that was a huge act of faith. That was their way of saying, okay, God, I'm giving this, and I'm worried about what's going to happen, but I trust you. And over the course of time, as they practiced that discipline, God would grow their faith. So it's God's way of saying to them, do you really believe your heavenly Father, who's unseen, sees you when you give? Do you trust him? Do you trust him with your stuff? Do you trust him to provide? Do you trust him? And as they wrestle with that question, God would grow their faith. And that's the question for us today. This first discipline, it's Jesus talking about our stuff. Do we trust God with our stuff? So that's the first discipline. Number two, verse five, he's talking about time now. Do we trust God with our time? So when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. So first he was saying, will you trust God with your money? Now he's saying, will you trust God with your time? Because we're all busy. Everyone here is busy. Everyone here has a million things to do. And what God is saying to us is that, yes, uh, I know you're busy. And time is actually your most valuable asset. You might lose money. You can always make more money. You might lose friends. You can always make more friends. But you can never get back the time you've lost. So that's actually your most valuable asset. And Jesus is saying, I want to, you to take your time, and I want you to give it to me. I want you to set aside time, close the door, go off by yourself, and carve out some time to spend with your Heavenly Father. Do you trust God with your time? And when I think about that, it seems crazy because all of us are so busy. Even thinking through these disciplines, we have all those things to do. All of us are so busy and we're saying, God, don't you know how busy I am? Do you really think I have time to take a few minutes every single day to talk to you who's unseen? Like that requires faith to walk into a room, close the door and talk to yourself. That's what people in asylums do. And now God is telling us to do that. That seems crazy, but that is what Jesus is telling us. He's saying, God wants you to make this a private discipline. Go off by yourself, close the door, and talk to your father. And then here's the promise. If you give God your time, then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. There's a reward. When we make that a discipline, to carve out a few minutes to connect with God, to talk with God, to tell him what we're worried about, to tell him what we're confused about, to tell him what, where we need help in. When we take that time to thank him, something happens. We're rewarded. And Jesus, in both of these cases, he uses the most intimate words possible. Your heavenly Father who is unseen sees what you do in secret. When you go off by yourself and you connect, your Heavenly Father sees that and the promise is He will reward you. And that's why for 2,000 years, Christians all around the world, they've been doing this practice of carving out time to connect with God. And if you talk to someone who's been doing it for years and you ask them, what's the reward? How are you being rewarded to 
by praying to God every single day, you know what they're not going to say? They're not going to say, well, God answers all my prayers now, because that's really not going to happen. They're not going to say, when I pray, I move mountains, because that's not going to happen. What they are going to say is that after connecting with God, after spending those few minutes with God, when they get up to face the day, they're going to say things like this. I get up, and I don't know what I'm going to face that day, but I have this uncanny assurance, this complete confidence that I'm not going off to face the troubles of today by myself. There's this sense in which I know with absolute confidence that my Heavenly Father is going with me. He's going to walk with me to my job. He's going to walk with me to face whatever challenges I have. I have a sense that God is with me. That's the reward. The reward is big faith, growing faith faith. Faith that overcomes our fears, our worries, our anxieties. And that is what God wants for all of us. These disciplines, they're just mechanisms. They're, they're, they're things God uses to get us there to a place where we can say, God, I trust you. And over time, when you hear their stories, they're going to say, it started off as hard. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to read. The Bible didn't make any sense to me. It started off as a discipline, but over time, it became a delight. And when you talk to them now, they say, you know what? I, I can't even go a day without doing it. Like, if, if I don't connect with God in the morning, I don't know what's going to happen that day. If I don't connect with God that morning, I'm not even my real self. I need to. And they look forward to it. It's become a delight. This discipline became a delight. Jesus is going to continue. He's going to teach us another private discipline called fasting. And fasting, first it was money, then it was time. And this is about our health, our sustenance. And do you trust God with your health? Do you trust God to sustain you? I'm not going to read it. And then he closes this section by teaching us a prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And it's a prayer of delight, of saying, Our Father, help us. I need your help. I need, I need to trust you for my daily provision. I need to trust you with guidance. I need to trust you to provide. I need you to, I just need you. It's a prayer of delight. And God uses these five things in many different ways. And the first things we talked about, there are things we have to rely on God for. God has to come through and speak to us through the Bible. God has to put people in our lives. This is the first thing God uses that we can have a role in, that we can be proactive. And the other ones, we can create a potential for God to use. But this is the one where I, you, together, we can proactively make a decision to practice these private disciplines. And if, if we do those, God is going to work with us to grow, to build, to develop, to mature our faith. And these two issues here, money and time, they're expressions of trust. We can say, God, I trust you when we give. We can say, God, I trust you. I trust that you control my money. I trust that you control my time. And over time, as we learn to do these private disciplines, God begins to grow our faith. So here's the challenge for us. Here's where I want to end. I want all of us to try this for 30 days. We're going to take one month. I just want you to try. If you've never tried this, this is going to be the best month you've ever experienced in your life. I want you to try for 30 days to carve out the first few minutes of your day and connect with God. I want you to just wake up a little bit earlier. I want you to get up. I want you to go to a room by yourself. It could be any room. Close the door. And I want you to talk with God. I want you to go over your prayer list. I want you to read the Bible. Just take those first few minutes of your day and connect with God. And I know you're already feeling the tension. I can I can use that time to answer email. I can use that time to uh, make breakfast. I can use that time to uh, catch up on Walking Dead, whatever. You can. But, but if you use that time to connect with God, something's going to happen. That tension you're feeling, I don't know what this does. I don't know what this what, is this accomplishing anything. God is going to use that time to grow your faith. And over these next 30 days, when you take those first few minutes, you're going to begin to be 
see your faith grow. You're going to learn to depend on God, to trust God, to talk with God. Your faith is going to grow, and that's the reward. Your reward is going to be that when you get up after spending that time with God, you're going to get up to face the day with a different perspective, with a different sense of energy. You're going to experience abundant life. You're going to not walk by yourself. You're going to overcome these challenges because you focus yourself on God, and He's going to do things in you that are going to be incredible. So together, I've challenged every single service. I've challenged everyone. Together, for the next 30 days, we're going to carve out the first few minutes of our days to connect with God. And then after these 30 days, I would love for you to send me your stories of what's happened. Email me uh, or text me or whatever it is. But um, let me just say this last thing. Three of the best moms that I know, uh, my mom, obviously, uh, my wife, obviously, and my mother-in-law, obviously, all three of them, and there's awesome moms here too. You're awesome. If I didn't say your name, you're still awesome. There's three, these three moms, all three of them start their day by carving out time to connect with God. My wife gets a cup of coffee first, but then she connects with God. But um, for all of them, they do that. And I don't think it's a coincidence. They're great moms. They've modeled that. They're teaching us. So guys, we can learn from these moms and these other moms that are doing that. We can carve out some time to connect with God. And over time, we're going to see progress. Our faith is going to grow. And as your faith grows, your dependence, your trust, your intimacy with God will grow. And that's what he wants. He wants to grow your faith. So stand with me. I'm going to close in a word of prayer. I'm going to send us off to do that. Uh, moms, we have a special treat for you today. We have a photographer who has a photo booth set up to take pictures of you. You can take a picture by